one from Fairfax, Ms. Fillercorn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Gentlemen, may proceed. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, we're in the last few days of the session, and clearly the issue of this session is whether or not we close the coverage gap and help ensure 400,000 Virginians. Unfortunately, we're facing a choice between how to make this work versus simply no. Last year, the main issue was transportation, and after navigating many hurdles, we made that work. I truly believe that we all can find a way to help so many in all corners of the Commonwealth whose quality of life right now depends on the actions we take here today. Often in this House, we hear of Washington-style politics. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, 10 days ago, there was another type of politics that came to Washington, D.C., and that was the National Governors Association. One of the biggest stories that came out of that meeting was the number of Republican governors working together trying to find solutions to the, uh, solutions to the coverage gap through the private option. The federal government has, a, has approved plans already with Governor Bradstad, Brandstad of Iowa and Governor Snyder of Michigan. And they are, are continuing their negotiations with other governors, like Governor Corbett of Pennsylvania and even Governor Pence of Indiana. I don't know if there was a bigger opponent of the Affordable Care Act in Congress than Governor Pence, but he is trying to make a way to use federal funds to help cover the individuals in his state. Yet we keep hearing reasons why we can't figure out a way to take the $5 million a day that has been set aside for Virginia, which with our people and our businesses have already paid in through taxes. These are funds that we can get back now to cover those badly in need of health care. We've heard so many stories on the floor and so many stories we've read about, and so many of us have had discussions with countless individuals. Real, moving real-life situation told by my colleague, Delegate Ward, on the floor on Tuesday. We've also spent so much time in agreement on the floor trying to improve our mental health system. Let's not lose sight of the fact that a substantial amount of these funds would go towards mental health services. Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen, we also keep hearing about the Merck Commission. We've heard about the Merck Commission on the, uh, Commission on the floor, that they need more time to work, more time to complete its work before we can move forward. But it's important to note that the Commission is made up evenly divided between members of the House and the Senate. And it's interesting to note that the Senate members have not found the work of the Commission to be worthy of a delay at this time. In fact, Senate Republican members of the Commission have been key proponents of Marketplace Virginia program. Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House, the ground has been shifted in the years since the Commission began its work. So many states are taking the funding to expand health care. Why can't we continue the work of the Commission while we use the funds set aside in the Commonwealth of Virginia? The funds were set aside for our use. We have also heard that some of the federal money is not guaranteed to be there in future years. Why should we think that funding to provide health care for millions across the country would be the first to be stripped away. Imagine in 2022, if we look back, we're forced to look at our actions of today, and we find out that the funding was never threatened. We could have had eight years looking in from the outside at other states whose people and economies benefited from this expanded health care. We could be forced to look back knowing that we could have helped hundreds of thousands of individuals for the past eight years knowing that our economy and our tax base could have been helped by eight years of 30,000 additional jobs. We have also heard that the House budget contains $118 million to help the hospitals. Is this a two-year Band-Aid, or is it funding that will have to be taken from our general fund in every subsequent budget for years to come if we don't take the federal funds? Even so, this would be just a fraction of the funding that our hospitals need, just a fraction. This 118 million is funding that could be used these days for schools in my area and across the Commonwealth. If we say no to Marketplace Virginia, the only option for some people will be to go to the emergency room for health care. But what do we say to these people if a hospital closes? If the hospital closes, what options do they have? Because we failed to secure the vital funds for these hospitals from the plan. 
not to mention the loss of jobs that would occur from the closing of a hospital. How, many, how much more funding would be needed to open a hospital that is closed or build a new facility in the same region? Think about it. While some here have been critical, I am pleased that the governor has been spending time out and about with doctors, talking to doctors, talking to nurses, and employees at hospitals throughout the Commonwealth. What better way to hear about people visit than visiting an emergency room that could be better helped in a doctor's office or a clinic? Close to my district, Inova Fairfax Hospital saw over 18,000 uninsured patients in their emergency room last year alone. 18,000 uninsured patients. That was over 17% of the ER, ER patients, averaging out to over one uninsured patient every half hour in just that one hospital alone. Shocking. Most of these costs end up being covered by higher insurance premiums or charity care. I truly believe that if we come together with a plan for both sides here to make this work, I believe we can do it. Even the Arkansas Republican legislature came together just yesterday as they reauthorized their private option with 75% voting in favor, 75%. These, there are people that we could help right now, Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the House. They don't want us to wait until next year. They can't wait until next year. Even a special session would mean delay or false hope for them, especially if the answer from some remains simply no. We don't even have to say that this could happen if everyone comes to the table. Everybody is already at the table. All we need to do is eliminate the word no. Rather than just no, I would hope my Republican colleagues could add their ideas to the Marketplace Virginia program. Come up with may ways to make the program better while addressing all concerns. I think we have seen through federal negotiations with other private option states some that we've mentioned here on the floor, that there is a willingness to work with us, and they've already done so. For those that question if the government would approve our plan, maybe our request would be helped if we had input from all sides, all of us together, a united front, and a desire to have the best program that could work for all of our people. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, across the country, leaders of both parties are trying to have their states close the coverage gap in a way that works best for each one each state. Let me end with the words of one governor in a speech given last year when he said, and I quote, I can't look at the disabled. I can't look at the poor. I can't look at the mentally ill. I can't look at the addicted. And I think, I can't look at the addicted and think we ought to ignore them. For those that live in the shadows of life, those who are the least among us, I will not accept the fact that the most vulnerable in our state should be ignored. We can help them. And I want all of you to think about this. That was Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich. Let's think about this here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Let's, this, let's make this work for all of our people, all of us together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.